So in this video, I'm going to be looking at Edexcel electric circuits, and I'm going to try and complete everything on one page. So the first thing we're going to start with is the letter Q. Now Q stands for the charge on an object, and small objects, for example, electrons, all have a charge. And we measure charge in the unit of coulombs, which is a capital C. Now, if we were to maybe look at how much charge goes past a point, we can look at the change in charge divided by the change in time. And this is what we then call an electric current. So time, as always, is measured in seconds, and the current then is measured in amperes or amps. So what we can really say is that electric current is the rate of flow of charged particles. Now these charged particles most of the time are electrons, these small negatively charged particles that we have going around the outside of an atom, but also we could have perhaps the flow of things which have a, a positive or a negative charge, perhaps some ions. But in terms of electric circuits we're just really going to consider electrons at the moment. And uh, I is used to represent the current because this is like the intensity of current, and Q represents the charge because it's a bit like the quantity of charge. In actual fact, we can also write this equation as the charge transferred is equal to the current times the change in time. So Q equals IT is another form of this. So over here, what we've looked at is current. Something else which is really important to look at in a circuit is voltage. Now the voltage, uh, I'm going to call vo voltage at the moment, later on we're going to be looking at EMF and potential difference, so I'm just going to call it voltage at the moment, and we represent this with a capital V, and this is also the unit of the volts, which also has a letter capital V. Now voltage is really the energy transferred, which I'm going to put W for work, over the charge transferred. So again, we've got work or energy in joules, and our charge in coulombs. So voltage is the energy per unit charge. Now if we know about the current and the voltage we can also look at something else and this is called the resistance. And the resistance of an object is defined as the voltage across it divided by the current through it. Now again we've got the voltage measured in volts, the current in amps, and the resistance is in the unit of the ohms, which has this Greek omega symbol over here. And this is our definition of resistance. It's the voltage across a component divided by the current through it. Effectively, something that has a higher resistance is going to let less current flow. A really important form of this equation that you often see is that V is equal to IR. So that's how these three things are all linked together. There's also something called Ohm's law. And Ohm's law states that for certain components, the current is proportional to the voltage, provided we have a constant temperature. So we've got some equations that we've seen in isolation, but what's really important is actually how this works in an electric circuit. And there are a couple of rules. They're, they're fairly simple, but it's something that you've just got to get your head around. Now, the first one is maybe looking at the current in that circuit. And what we can say is if we had a junction, uh, perhaps we've got uh, some current coming in. I'm going to call it I1, and this is our junction here. If this maybe were, was to split into two different directions, so we've maybe got I2, the current up this way, and I3 down there, what we can say is that the current going into the junction is equal to the current going out of the junction. And this comes from the conservation of charge. Because current is that rate of flow of charged particles, and we don't get a charge building up at that junction in the circuit. So effectively, we could say here that I1 is equal to I2 plus I3 in this particular case where we've got the current splitting at that junction, but overall we tend to say that the sum of the currents in and out of that junction is equal to zero. Now this is actually called Kirchhoff's first law, and this is something which is really useful when it comes to analysing circuits. So we can say the currents in are the currents out. We can also think about what happens with the voltage 
in a circuit. And I'm just going to draw a very simple circuit where we have a power supply. So this is our cell. And maybe this is connected up to two resistors. Now there aren't that many electrical components you need to learn the symbols of, but you get you really used to them as you do more and more questions. So this here is our source of the voltage in that circuit. And I'm going to label that with this curly epsilon. And that's going to stand for the EMF. OK, now across each of these resistors, we could measure the voltage using a voltmeter. So maybe we've got V1 across this, which is going to be resistor 1. And across resistor 2, we could use a voltmeter in parallel to register the voltage across that. Now the EMF is the voltage supplied to the circuit. And across each of these, really, we should be calling this the potential difference. And this links back to voltage. And let me just write down the definition here. So we've got EMF. Now the EMF is the energy transferred per unit charge into the circuit from another source, perhaps from a battery, whereas potential difference is the energy transferred by the circuit to a component, perhaps a resistor or a lamp. So here, what we can say is that the sum of the EMFs is equal to the sum of the potential differences around that circuit. So here, we would say that the EMF is equal to V1 plus V2. So for example, if that was a six volt power supply, we had two volts there, then this would leave four volts across this other resistor. So the EMFs in are equal to the potential differences across any closed loop in that circuit. If we had maybe a parallel circuit where again we have a power supply and we have different components on a different loop, then around any closed loop in that circuit, the sum of the EMFs is going to be equal to the sum of the potential differences. So here we might have a six volt power supply. We'd have six volts across this and also six volts across that. And this comes from the conservation of energy. And this is also known as Kirchhoff's second law. Now the other thing we can look at when it comes to circuits is the resistance of components either in series or in parallel. So let's imagine, again, we've just got a very simple circuit where we've got a power supply, we've got two resistors, just in series like that. And I'm interested in the total current, which I'm going to call IT, which is leaving that cell, and then we're going to have I1, in this resistor and I2 in that resistor. Now these are, I'm just going to label this as R1 and R2. And what we can look at is the equivalent resistance of these two resistors. Now the other thing in this circuit is that we're going to have a certain um, uh, power supply here which is maybe at V volts and we're going to have V1 across this and V2 across that and I'm going to call this VT, which would be the total uh, potential difference across these two components. Now what we can say, first of all, by thinking about Kirchhoff's second law, is that uh, the total voltage or EMF of that cell is equal to V1 plus V2. We also know, of course, that V is equal to I times R, so VT is also the same as IT times RT. So that's the same as the combined resistance of these two things times the current um, that's leaving the cell. And that's going to be equal to I1 R1 plus I2 R2. Okay, so the current times the resistance of that resistor plus the current times the resistance of that resistor. But now if we think about Kirchhoff's first law, whatever the current into a junction is going to be the same as the current out. And in a series circuit, we're going to have the same current everywhere. So we can also say that IT is equal to I1, which is equal to I2. And because of that, these I's all cancel with each other. And we can then see this is left as the total resistance RT is equal to R1 plus R2. So this is the equation for looking at the combined resistance of resistors in series. And we could obviously complete this if we had more resistors until we had Rn. So for any number of resistors in series, the total resistance just adds up and adds up. Okay, so that is something in series. But what would happen if instead of this we had, again, a power supply, and we had a resistor in parallel with another resistor? Okay, 
And again, I'm going to call this one R1 and this one R2. And what we're going to look at here is their combined resistance. Now, just like before, we're going to have a t um, VT is going to be effectively their combined potential difference, which is also going to be the potential difference across the cell. And then we've got V1 and we've got V2 across each of those resistors. And going through this, we're going to have, I'm going to just call it I1 over here and I2. So what do we know? Well, we know that the combined current, which is going to be leaving this cell, which I'm going to call IT, that current is going to split at this junction here. We're going to have I1 going this way. We're going to have I2 going this way and through that component. So we can say the total current is equal to I1 plus I2. Okay, and that's from Kirchhoff's first law, looking at conservation of charge. We also know that um, because V is equal to IR, I is going to be equal to V divided by R. Okay, so we can say the total current is equal to VT divided by RT, and that's equal to I, sorry, V1 over R1 plus V2 over R. R2. And as a consequence of, new, of uh, Kirchhoff's second law, the EMF is going to be equal to the sum of the potential difference around any closed loop. So VT is equal to V1, which is equal to V2, and that's why these all cancel. And we can rewrite this as 1 over RT is equal to 1 over R1 plus 1 over R2. And it doesn't matter how many resistors we'd have, we just add 1 over Rn. So if we had more resistors in parallel, we'd have a combined resistance which is lower. And if you're doing any equations for this where you've got questions, make sure that you do take 1 over your value to get the value of Rt. So some circuit rules, we've got conservation of charge, and therefore I in is equal to I out. Conservation of energy, so the EMFs are equal to the PDs, and we've got resistors in series and parallel. Few. There's a lot going on there, and we've got loads of space still to fill. The next thing we can do is we can look at electrical power. Now, don't forget, of course, that power is equal to the energy transferred per unit time, or sometimes this is also then the work done per unit time. OK, so both of these equations can be used, and we measure power in watts, we measure energy in joules and time in seconds. Now there's another way of looking at the power. Perhaps we've got um, the energy transferred per um, second from a component in a circuit. And here what we can say is that the power is equal to the current times the potential difference across it. So P equals IV, or indeed actually P is equal to VI, which is uh, the way it's displayed um, for Edexcel, the power is equal to potential difference times the current. So that's one equation that you need to know about. The other equation that we can say is that if we know the, the work done or the energy transferred divided by time is the power, then power times time is equal to the energy transferred. So here W is equal to the power, which is VI, multiplied by the time, which is T. So these two equations here um, are both ones that you can use for a circuit. But there are a couple more. Now the first one we can do is if we start with P is equal to VI, we know from over here that V is equal to IR, so we can replace this V over here with IR. So we can also write that as P is equal to IR times I, which is then equal to I squared R. So if you know the current and the resistance, you can work out the power without needing to know about the potential difference. So that's one of the equations. The other one um, is, again, if we start with P is equal to VI, we can also say that I is equal to V divided by R. So we can also then say that P is equal to V times V over R, and that means P is equal to V squared over R. So again, maybe you know the potential difference across something and you know its resistance, you can then calculate the power without needing to know the current at that time.
Now you'll see here there are loads and loads of different equations and the more questions you do the more use you're going to get to actually choosing the right equation for that uh, appropriate scenario that you've got in that question. So we've got uh, resistors, we've got power and um, now let's have a look at some actual components. So we've got things like uh, filament bulbs, we've got bits of wire, we've got resistors um, and so on. So this is actually how you build real circuits. And what we can do is we can test their properties. Now, in its simplest form, uh, we might have a power source. And what we then do is connect up an ammeter to measure the current going through that component. And then uh, effectively in this gap here is where you would have the component that you're testing, perhaps it's a resistor. Now across this, we're gonna have a voltmeter to measure the potential difference. And what we can do is in order to get different values of current and potential difference, is we can add in a variable resistor. And also, because we don't want any heating effect, we want to keep the temperature constant, we want to have a switch in that circuit. So we can turn it on, we can test the component. So I'm just gonna put a little box here to be the component that we're testing. And then we can get values for current and potential difference. And what we can then do is display that on a graph. Now there are four main graphs we need to know about. The first one is for a resistor or even what we call an ohmic conductor. And here, with a resistor, it has a constant resistance. And this means we get a straight line that goes through the origin. And this is for something where Ohm's law can apply because here we can say that the current I is proportional to V and this is um, if you've got an ohmic conductor that's where something is at a constant temperature and I is proportional to V and this is the IV graph that we get. The other one that we get is for a filament lamp and here we get a curve that gets steeper at the origin and then it flattens out and that's because the resistance changes as you have a higher current we have a greater heating effect on the actual metal wire inside and this causes the resistance to increase so this is what you get with a filament lamp we also have a component called a thermistor and actually when you've got a greater current going through it it's going to get hotter but when this gets hotter the resistance decreases and what we have now is a curve that looks like this, okay? So this one here is different to the shape of the curve here. This one gets is steeper, then it gets flatter. This one has an increasing gradient on it. Now the last thing we have is the diode, and this in one direction allows no current to flow, but then when you've got a certain value of potential difference, it allows current to flow. So you might be familiar with LEDs, which are light emitting diodes, but even a normal diode has the same properties. So these are the IV characteristics that you should be able to recognise. And again, there's a few different ways of actually setting up the circuit, but it's these shapes here of the graphs that you should be familiar with. And the final thing that I need to say about the characteristics of these components is that the resistance is not the gradient. You simply need to find the value of the potential difference and the value of the current and that gives you the resistance. It is not the same as dV by dI, and therefore the resistance is not the gradient. That is really important to remember. Now we've defined resistance as a potential difference divided by the current, but the value of resistance, perhaps just for a piece of wire, is gonna depend on a number of factors. It's gonna depend upon how long that piece of wire is. So the longer the wire, the more resistance because, well, we'll talk about that in a minute. But it also depends upon the cross-sectional area. Effectively, if you've got something which is wider, then there's going to be more paths for the electrons to flow down, and that means the resistance decreases. So it's also going to depend upon one over the area. And the final thing it really depends upon is the type of material. So copper is going to have a different resistance to the same uh, dimensions of a piece of aluminium or gold or something else. And this is what we call the resistivity. So the resistivity is measured in ohm meters and we use the Greek letter rho to represent the resistivity. And there is a core practical where what you can do is you can 
change the length of the piece of wire and we can then measure the current through it and the potential difference across it, which allows you to work out the resistance. And if you use uh, perhaps a micrometer screw gauge or a vernier caliper, you can very carefully measure the diameter of the wire to work out the cross-sectional area. So if you know the length and the area and the resistance, we can then plot some data to find out the value of the resistivity of that material. But I'm going to talk about that more in another video, but that's one of the core practicals that you need to know about. Now, the other thing, again, let me just introduce a further equation. Uh, we can say that the current that's actually perhaps moving around a circuit, it depends on N, Q, V, and A. So, this is an equation that has a lot of factors in it. We've got Q, and here small Q stands for the charge on the uh, charge carriers, perhaps the charge on an individual electron, which don't forget, is 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19 coulombs and if it's an electron it's going to be a negative value okay we tend to use big Q for the total charge transferred and small Q for the charge on an individual charge carrier uh, we also have the cross-sectional area of the wire V is the mean drift velocity of those charge carriers and actually what we find is that even in an electric circuit the electrons although they might be moving around randomly very quickly their overall movement when a potential difference is applied is actually relatively slow and here n is going to be the density of charge carriers so something like copper there's going to be a lot more free electrons which ultimately means it's a better conductor but this value, the density of charge carriers, can change. And that's used to great effect in things like light-dependent resistors and also the thermistors that we have over here. And if we're changing the density of charge carriers, this is also going to change, in turn, the resistivity of that material, which is why the resistance of that material can change as well. The other thing I'd just like to talk about briefly is the potential difference across perhaps a different length of wire. So perhaps we have a very simple circuit. Uh, so again, we've got um, a power supply, and I'm going to connect this up to this wire that we have here. Now, imagine we had a 6 volt cell over here. If we had a voltmeter, and we put the voltmeter across effectively zero length over there, the reading it would give would be zero volts. If we put the voltmeter across the total length of this wire, and we can, we're just going to ignore the bits of wire in here, it would give a reading of 6 volts. If we connected it up halfway, it would give a reading of 3 volts, and so on. And effectively, the potential along this piece of wire varies with the distance along it. And actually, we can take this one stage further by thinking about what we call potential divider circuits. And now, again, I'm just going to think of a simple scenario where we've got a power supply and we've got two resistors. Okay, now here we've got two resistors and although there might be a potential difference, let's say there's V volts uh, from that cell, these are going to divide that potential, which is why it's called a potential divider circuit. Now let's imagine with some numbers, if this was a six volt supply and these were identical resistors, that would have 3 volts across it, and that would have 3 volts across it. Pretty straightforward. If we had a similar circuit, again, let's say this is a 6 volt supply. Excuse my kind of a hand-drawn things. Now this time, the resistors are not identical. Perhaps this resistor has a higher resistance than this one. Then perhaps this might have 4 volts across it, and that might have 2 volts across it. And now they're not sharing that uh, they're not dividing the potential equally, and it really depends upon the, re the ratio of the resistance of this to the resistance of that. Effectively, something with a bigger resistance is going to get a greater share of that potential difference. And let's say we had resistor 1 and resistor 2. What we can say is that the ratios of V1 to V2 are going to be the same as the ratios of R1 to R2. Okay, effectively, as you have a bigger potential difference across something, that's because it has a higher value of resistance. Now, there is a potential divider equation that we can look at. I'm just going to draw the circuit over here. I'm going to label the power supply as V in. This is going to be resistor 1, 
and that's resistor 2. Okay, so that's going to have a value of R1 across it. That's got a value of R2. And we can also maybe measure the potential difference across resistor 2, which we're going to call V out. Now, there is an equation that says the value of this potential difference, V out, is equal to V in multiplied by R2 over R1 plus R2. Now this equation is often seen, it's called the potential divider equation, but it only works for this scenario here. And that's where we're looking at V out across this second resistor when there's only a voltmeter connected um, across it. If instead we had maybe another resistor or different components across this, this equation wouldn't apply in those situations. This is only when we've just got two resistors and we've got the, we're just measuring the potential difference across it. So why are potential divider circuits used? Well, they're used because rather than having fixed values of resistors, we could actually choose something which changes its resistance. Perhaps R1 could instead be perhaps a variable resistor. So we could change the size of this resistance, which is then going to change the ratio of R1 to R2, which is going to affect the potential difference across this component. We might instead have something which changes its resistance automatically. We might have a thermistor, or even we have, might have a light dependent resistor. And this is then used in a sensing circuit. So when this detects that the resistance changes, it's going to affect the value of the potential difference across this part. And that's how we can actually use LDRs to turn the lights on when it gets dark, or we can use thermistors to perhaps turn off the heater when it gets to a certain value of temperature. So potential divider circuits, they can look complicated, but what you've got to do is just work around it in turn using the right equation. And it could be V equals I times R. We could be using or looking at the values of the potential differences. There are so many equations over here that you can apply. And again, you're going to get good at that by doing more and more practice questions. And just a note about an LDR. With an LDR, the light dependent resistor, if we're looking at the resistance and we're maybe looking at the light intensity, which is often measured in lux, we find this happens. As it gets lighter and brighter, then the resistance decreases. Similarly, if we're looking at a thermistor, as it gets hotter, so maybe we have temperature along the bottom and resistance up here, as the temperature increases, the resistance decreases. And the reason for that is that as you get to a higher temperature, more charge carriers are released. And when we've got a higher number of these charge carriers, that means it changes the resistivity and the resistance decreases. OK, just like um, when you've got an LDR, when you have something which is brighter, it releases more of these charge carriers. So the value of N increases. And that then means that we've got something which is going to conduct better and it has a lower resistance. Now, a thermistor is what we call a semiconductor, and it behaves in a different way to a normal piece of wire. Normally in a piece of wire, as something gets hotter, the resistance increases. And the reason for that is that we've got this metal core of um, metal ions, and around this we have the free electrons which are charging around it. As the temperature increases, these things start to vibrate more and more, and that means there's going to be more collisions between the electrons and the vibrating metal lattice. And that's why at higher temperatures, because these things here are vibrating more, it's harder for the electrons to move through, and that's why the resistance increases, which is the opposite to what happens in a thermistor. And the very last thing I want to talk about is what we call internal resistance. And this is little r. Now, imagine we have a cell, it's not perfect, and effectively we can consider what we call the internal resistance of that power supply, okay? And to show that this is effectively representing the resistance of that cell, I'm just going to put a dotted line around this. And then we can connect this up to the rest of our normal circuit, and I'm just going to put a normal resistor here. I'm going to call that big R, and that just represents the resistance of that external part of the circuit. Now, what we might be able to do is we might be able to put um, a voltmeter across the terminals 
of that power supply and we can read a value in volts. Now the reading that we read, V, is what we call the terminal PD. It's a potential difference across the terminals. But that's not actually the same as the EMF of that internal supply. So it might say it's a 6 volt supply, but we can only ever read maybe 5.8, 5.6. And there's an equation that basically says the EMF is equal to the terminal PD plus I times little r. And effectively, the bigger the current in that circuit, the, great, the, the lower the value of terminal PD that we get. Effectively, if we had no current flowing, this would be a 6 volt power supply, but as soon as any current starts to flow, we maybe only get a value of 5.8 or 5.6. There's um, a core practical that we have concerning this. And with this core practical, we take some data uh, of the terminal PD and the current, and we get a value on a graph that looks like this, where the gradient is equal to minus the value of the internal resistance, and the intercept is equal to the EMF. But I'm going to cover that more in another video. So I think that just about covers everything that you need to know about, about electric circuits. There are a lot of equations here, lots of bits of information to look at, and, the, and I've said it before, the more you practice circuit equations, the more you'll identify when it's the right time to use any one of these many equations I've just talked about. So that is just my summary for the Edexcel IAL electric circuits part of the course.